please be seated. Let's continue our meeting. And before I hand the floor over to the lead co-lawyers for the civil parties, I have some uh, questions for the deputy international prosecutor. I have heard your presentation. Regarding your submission to the trial chamber for the trial of 002-02, some charges and by dropping other charges And that's also mentioned in your written submission E three zero six last two. In paragraph sixty three of the order by the Trimcard Chamber In order to facilitate the necessities and to allow the smoothness and the justice for the indictment of this uh, large-scale trial, the ICTY and the SCSL and the Yugoslavia Tribunal actually amended their internal rules to allow their respective trial chambers to invite the prosecutor to reduce or order proprio motu the reduction of the number of counts charged in an indictment. And for the purpose of the implementation of the law in regards to the case 002, we follow internal rule 79.1. The trial chamber is seized of the indictment by the co-investigating judges or the decision of the trial chamber. And in the case of case 002, the trial chamber is seized of the case by the, by the order, by such order, the question to you, that is to the uh, prosecution, regarding your ability to drop some charges, or a cramped size, or parts of the charges, and how can you do that, legally speaking? What are the legal grounds for your decision to drop or to remove some of those charges? That is, uh, allowing the trial chamber to proceed with those charges that you submit. There has to be legal grounds for that. And second, the remaining charges that you dropped, we cannot proceed with that, or, or can we, legally speaking. In the Cambodian legal context, there is no provision for the prosecution to drop the charges. Can you enlighten the chamber on that? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, the basis um, for our suggestion is that the Supreme Court, uh, in its decision, has now recognized that these procedures uh, are available. Now, I understand that there are people who may not agree with that interpretation. But the Supreme Court 
uh, has now provided you with options. Uh, this is a complicated issue. We, we have not attempted and we do not propose at this time that this chamber make a decision on this. This is something uh, that, that should be, uh, I believe, briefed. Um, but whether we're talking about severing these crime sites and then determining this complex issue, uh, that is certainly something that this court can do. This court can sever the crime sites that we propose to be excluded. But at some point, we believe that uh, we do need to address this issue. The Supreme Court has suggested two approaches to a dealing uh, with these additional crime sites that would not necessitate trying them. I understand what Your Honor is saying, that it's not part of Cambodian procedure. They are relying on practices at the international level. Um, but that is the basis uh, for our suggestion on this issue, is, is the paragraphs uh, from the Supreme Court's decision uh, that uh, provide uh, a couple of options, and that's paragraphs uh, 61 through 63 of the November decision. If I could just add, Your Honor, to explain a bit more our position. Again, our position is to that this trial, 0202, should cover all of the legal charges. One, if one looks at the closing order in the disposition section, the very end of the closing order, all that's mentioned is the actual legal charges. We recognize that it would be, in our view, inefficient to cover every crime site mentioned in the closing order. And we don't think that's necessary because what the closing order makes clear is that the crimes that are alleged against the accused occurred nationwide. And this was part of the uh, decision of the pretrial chamber in its decision on admitting victims who were not named in particular crime sites that they could participate in these proceedings. The pretrial chamber pointed out that from this closing order, what's alleged is crimes that occurred throughout the country. We're going to prove that. We intend to prove that in case 02, limiting the examples, as in every international case, to some specific locations. Because we can't prove every crime that happened in Cambodia during the regime of democratic Kampuchea, what happened to six million or seven million people. We will give examples that are representative that show that all of these crimes occurred as part of a national policy of the regime. And additionally, of course, this case is so different from cases that occur in domestic settings, whether in Cambodia or France or everywhere, anywhere else, because of the size of the case and because of the role of the victims. So it's already been decided by your honors in earlier decisions that reparations in this case will not be individual. They will be reparations based uh, on what happened to the group. And participation will, uh, in the proceedings, depend simply on being a victim of, the, of these crimes throughout the country, not on specific sites. So in these circumstances, we believe, putting together the Supreme Court decision and international jurisprudence and the unique nature of this case that dropping crime sites while covering all of the legal charges would be legal, would be sufficient, and uh, that's why we want to make it very clear. Our proposal is that this case, 0202, terminate the proceedings. It will cover all of the charges. We also think that's important for the donors to hear, both the international donors and the Cambodian government. Our plan is to finish our work, to do this extremely important case, to cover all of these horrible charges, and to finish in a reasonable period of time. Thank you. President, thank you. What is in my question is the legal grounds that you based 
And of course, I appreciate the selective uh, crime sites and charges uh, in your submission. But legally speaking, how you made your decision? And how shall we uh, proceed when you decide uh, to drop certain charges from the indictment? by the pretrial chamber. So what I would like you to enlighten us is purely the legal grounds. Because at the ICTY, it, it mentioned their decisions that is uh, in order to ensure the timely justice. And for that purpose, they allowed the prosecute, prosecutor to reduce the number of counts charge in an indictment or to fix a number of crime sites or incidents in respect of which evidence may be presented. At the ICTY, in order to allow the prosecutor to reduce or to drop the charges, it stipulated in their amended internal rules. However, in our internal rules, or in fact, uh, what we are having here in Cambodia, there is no such provision. So what I want you to enlighten us is the legal aspect for the reduction of the drop of the charges. And secondly, how shall we proceed? Because this is a big challenge for the trial chamber. And what you have stated, of course, will be published in the newspaper. And for us, as a judge, we cannot speak to the media about that. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, first of all, we recognize that the proposal that we have is subject to the final decision of Your Honors, uh, who have to decide on the exact scope of the, char of the trial. But we would point out that the rules and the practice of other international tribunals does form part of customary international law. And that practice has evolved to be quite consistent that in order to manage these extremely complex cases, the trial chamber does have the power to reduce, at a minimum, the crime sites, the evidence of particular crimes behind one count. We'd also point out, I understand that the Cambodian rules don't exactly address the situation. The rules of national or international courts, uh, in interpreting those rules, one must look at the reasons behind them. It makes sense in a national system where civil parties participate as individuals and seek individual reparations that the crimes covering certain civil parties cannot be dropped unilaterally by the prosecution. But that's not the situation of how this case has been handled in case 01 or case 0201. The civil parties are participating and the, any reparations will be to the group. And it's already been recognized by the pretrial chamber, and we believe that decision was absolutely correct, that individuals can participate even if they're not named in a particular crime site or if, if they're, the harm they suffer didn't occur in a crime site that's covered in the trial or covered even mentioned in the closing order. So the procedures in this court are already quite distinct from the national procedures, and it shouldn't you shouldn't automatically, in our view, take a national procedure that's designed for a case where a civil party will seek individual reparations and apply that to this case covering crimes that were inflicted more or less on an entire national population over a period of years. In these circumstances, in the interest of justice, we think it's only reasonable to interpret the rules as allowing the prosecution to prove this national policy by selective crime sites. Even, in, even if we presented every crime site mentioned in the closing order, we won't, of course, mention every victim 
at that cron site. That would be impossible to do. So we think that the path that we, that we propose, ultimately up to your honors to decide, uh, is sufficient and wouldn't require a change of the rules or a dismissal of any charges because all of the charges are going to be covered. They're going to be covered with specific examples of where these crimes occurred. However, if uh, your honors or someone thinks a rule change is necessary, then a rule change could be conducted. But the trial can begin before the rule change. The only issue is whether at the end of case 0202 something has to be done because some crime sites were not covered or, or it doesn't have to be done. In our view, nothing has to be done because we propose to prove a national policy. And uh, it also could occur that one of the victims from one of the crime sites may mention a crime that occurred in another part of the country. This is, in our view, the closing order shows a national policy as the pretrial chamber found. So we believe it's a practical and a legally defensible position that specific crime sites can be dropped. Thank you. Uh, oh. President, thank you. And uh, Judge Lavalanche, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. I do believe that to make headway on this, it might be useful to dissociate two separate problems. The first is the one that concerns the scope of the next trial. The second problem is the problem of what happens to the charges that are not included in the trial. To begin with, we could carry on with the practice that we have held so far, which is seeing if there is any need to undertake severance measures. And the scope of trial 002 stroke 2 could be set in that way through a severance decision, which would enable all of the parties to discuss what should be within the scope of the trial and what should not. As to the remaining charges, I believe that the Supreme Court has issued some instructions on that, but the President has said that the guidance from the Supreme Court raises a certain number of legal difficulties. Indictment in English is not translated by a series of charges, but by a decision to refer. And that is a decision that is taken by judges. Decision de renvoi. And so there's a problem of knowing whether a party, such as the prosecution, can decide to modify uh, something that already has the authority of res judicata. There are many problems here, and I don't think today is the right moment to go into this in depth. But just to mention one or two in our internal rules at 101, you have a rule that copies Article 357 of the Cambodian Criminal Code, and that rule says what has to be done when a verdict is drafted. What have the judges got to do when they set down to doing this? And in paragraph 3 of this, it quite clearly says that the chamber shall examine all counts in the indictment and the English all counts in the indictment is even clearer than the French tous les contre, etc. And there is also reference in the Supreme Court Chambers document 
to a certain number of other notions that have to be discussed. For example, they'll talk about prosecutorial legalism. Now, up to now, we do not have a French translation of the Supreme Court's decision, and my knowledge of English is somewhat modest, and sometimes I even do some translations myself. But to be perfectly honest, I'm not exactly sure how the notion of prosecutorial legalism should be translated into French. I understand that it may mean that the prosecutors are obliged to try the case. There is an obligation there. Or to prosecute. But if we go back to the Cambodian system, I'm wondering if this actually tallies with Article 40 of the Cambodian Criminal Code, which reflects a notion that is well known in France, which is the timeliness of prosecution. In other words, the prosecutor has the right to make an appreciation of whether or not uh, prosecution should be undertaken at a specific time. These are just a few examples. If we're going to talk about this, I think we should do so in depth. Perhaps the Chamber will issue its own views on the points of law that should be reviewed by the parties. But the discussion might perhaps take place at a later stage, and perhaps the immediate priority is to decide on the scope of the trial and to make a decision possibly on any uh, severance. I don't know what you think of this suggestion. Thank you, President. Well, we absolutely agree. Uh, the trial can proceed once we know the scope of the trial, and the issue of crime sites that we didn't deal with, we, we have much as we said, at least 96 court days to deal with. President, thank you. The issue that I raised and in regards to the scope of the facts to be tried in case 002-02 means that it is unavoidable that there has to be a, an extend, extensive debate as raised by Judge LaVange. What shall we do with the remaining charges? Shall we sever the case for those remaining charges so that the trial chamber is capable to try those charges included in 002-02. This is part and parcel of the case, and we cannot just uh, have it as a standalone proceeding. So we drop or so we sever the case. And that is a very uh, complex issue in terms of the legal aspects since the beginning of the first severance order by the trial chamber, which was subsequently appealed, in particular by the prosecution, because uh, mainly that is due to the different, uh, different uh, legal interpretation and whether it is based on the common law or the civil law system. And for that, I raise that issue because when you drop some charges, you introduce another complexity into the already complicated case. And for that, I believe uh, a sort of a discussion is uh, warranted. And of course, uh, it cannot be done right now. At least this is uh, some ideas for the parties to consider, as we already faced uh, this issue in our severance order. 
And of course, we don't want the uh, general public to misunderstand our position that not every separate case by the trial chamber is uh, subsequently appealed. So we have to be uh, precise on that and consistent on the legal interpretation. And we, if we already started to disagree on the principle of the law and its interpretation, then it's unavoidable that appeals will be made as a consequence. For instance, for the second severance order, it was also appealed, and that was for the same reason. And for that, in order to avoid it being appealed, then we shall discuss it thoroughly before that uh, order is issued. And for that, we can save some time to avoid the uh, uh, appeal. And of course, we don't have much time to conduct uh, several TMM for this case. Maybe there will be another one, and that will be it before the substantive uh, hearing uh, starts. And the chamber would like now to give the floor to the political lawyers for civil parties. You may proceed. Um, good morning, Mr. President, Your Honours, and good morning, everyone in and around the courtroom. On behalf of the consolidated civil parties, and in regards to the scope of 002-02, which is the next uh, trial segment, the civil parties agreed through the proposed scope of this trial as uh, submitted by the prosecution. We are of the view that there has to be an a judgment in in due course as we had to take into account the health and the age condition of the co accused. We also have to factor in the victims or the civil parties whose opportunity is slipping away from them due to their old age before the judgment can be issued. So for that, it is vitally important that a judgment is issued and so that they will know who are responsible for the facts and the crimes that they suffered. So for that, we fully agree with the, the proposed scope by the prosecution. Additionally, we also in a view that the proposal, the proposal by the prosecution includes the three uh, charges. That is uh, genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crime. Amongst the three main crimes, some selective facts or crime size, which are a representative of each crime is selected and some other charges are set aside. This is uh, my understanding. And the inclusion of those charges are in no way contradictory to our existing internal rules or the need to amend our internal rules. As for the remaining charges, it is our view our view is based also on the, our extensive consultation with our civil parties is that our clients want to hear and want to be present in this courtroom to hear the, the trial and the proceeding. It is rather difficult for us to take a firm position as to whether all the charges shall be included or whether we agree to the drop of those uh, certain charges. And I believe that it's the discretion of your honors to make such a, uh, 
a decision on the remaining uh, charges which are not proposed to be included in 002-02. As to the time needed to hear the testimonies of witnesses and civil parties, we submit that we will have our own list which is separate from the prosecution's list, although uh, some names may be repetitive And of course, we will submit our list to your honors when the scope of the next segment of the trial is clearly determined. We also want to add that we want the civil parties to be heard in a reasonable amount of uh, numbers of the civil parties, in particular those civil parties who may express their uh, suffering related to the relevant facts and uh, charges. And of course those charges are rather broad as uh, proposed by the prosecution. So we request that those civil parties to be heard about the suffering for at least eight court sitting days or more, if possible, as in the case of the 002-01. However, due to the time constraint and as we cannot delay the time any further, we opt for the same approach for hearing the civil parties who will talk about the harm and their suffering. And that is our position in regard to the scope of the trial as well as the list of the civil parties. Thank you, Your Honor. President, thank you. And what about the International Little Co-Lawyer for Civil Parties? Yes, as you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to add one comment on the discussion on what should remain, what should happen to the remaining charges or if charges can be dropped. I think it is crucial to consider what the meaning, the definition of charges is. Um, for us, charges is legal characterization plus the underlying alleged, uh, alleged factual circumstances. So in this, if that's the case, then charges cannot be dropped. And this is um, just for your consideration. We will reserve our right to file uh, written submissions on this point in the future. Thank you. President, thank you for your comments. The Chamber would like to give the floor now to Nguyen Chi's defense to rest at your opinion. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think all parties in this courtroom agree um, that it is a very complex legal issue to be decided uh, in respect of uh, uh, the question whether charges can be dropped. Uh, there are actually uh, many more issues um, involving uh, this matter. Um, and to just uh, come back to a point that the international co-prosecutor raised. Um, the ECCC is, of course, not an international tribunal. It is uh, a, a court uh, principally ruled by uh, domestic procedure. Uh, so whether it's possible, yes or no, uh, I think that is something to be discussed. Uh, we agree uh, on a later stage. However, uh, it's also good to uh, take practical considerations into account, and that is the question whether uh, the second trial might be de facto the only trial, um, which is going to happen in the near future. Uh, it needs no discussion uh, that our client is um, old and of uh, frail health, 
uh, and the, the possibility uh, for him uh, being present or, if, or alive um, during a third trial, of course, uh, remains to be seen. Now, having said that, uh, having realized that a second trial might be de facto the only trial, I think um, uh, what is very important to note is, is the following. Um, what is unclear to us uh, is um, uh, the question of uh, all kinds of other issues which are uh, being mentioned, which are raised in the closing order. Now, if we limit ourselves only to a few crime sites, uh, theoretically it might be possible that uh, many relevant issues will be again out of the debate. Um, as you know, uh, one of the main difficulties in the first trial was always the question whether certain questions asked to, the, uh, to a witness was within the scope of this specific trial or was without the, uh, outside of the scope of this specific trial. One thing I think uh, our defense team has learned from this experience is that is uh, a discussion which is generally speaking not, 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 not very helpful in the process of ascertaining the truth and uh, on the other hand establishing the individual criminal responsibility uh, of our client as I know. Um, so uh, to give you just uh, one or two examples from the closing order. Um, one of the things that we, for instance, uh, uh, would like to be able to discuss in a second trial is a matter which is not necessarily uh, related to any specific crime site. Now, that is, for instance, uh, uh, the results uh, laid down in the demographic report of uh, uh, Eva Tabot and the question in there, um, how many victims uh, have there been in total uh, during the DK period. Now this is something which we think is uh, a, a vital not only to the case but also to uh, a general understanding of the period uh, in large. So uh, the question of course is, is when we limit uh, ourselves to um, only one more trial, uh, would we still be able uh, to discuss uh, this matter although it is not directly linked to any crime site. The other issue is, um, as you know, and I, I do not need repeating this, uh, we have a, a rather different view uh, on the events and the policies established allegedly in the DK period in the prosecution. Uh, we do not believe there was a national policy. We believe that there were, uh, in fact, two uh, equally strong opposing, opposing factions within the Khmer Rouge uh, fighting each other uh, already from the very beginning uh, after 17 April 1975. Uh, uh, this is a theory, a defense theory, uh, if you like, uh, which we feel we should be able uh, to develop um, uh, also in the second trial. Now, the question arises uh, if we limit ourselves to uh, the crime sites proposed by the prosecution, uh, would that disallow us from uh, investigating uh, this alternative uh, theory uh, in respect of the events uh, between 75 and 79? To give you one concrete example, if uh, the defense team uh, of New Chia would be uh, keen on establishing uh, the theory that it was in fact uh, the, 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 the leader of the northwest zone, uh, Runim, together with the leader of the east zone, Sao Pim, who were in fact um, uh, conspiring against uh, others within uh, the Standing and Central Committee, how would we go about that? Um, if we look at the, the actual closing order, there might be crime sites which would, in theory, allow the defense to further develop uh, this theory. I'll give you one example. Um, uh, it's a crime not mentioned uh, in the proposal by the prosecution. That is the movement, uh, or the third movement of population uh, from the east zone. Uh, these would be paragraphs 283 uh, until 301. As we understand the closing order, uh, the third movement was, uh, has to be seen in the context of uh, uh, purges uh, within the East Zone 
and uh, uh, all kinds of ideas about uh, treason within the East Zone. Now, typically, that could be, we don't, we don't say it will be, but it could be a crime site in which uh, the defense would be uh, allowed to further develop its, its theory. Uh, the same goes, for instance, for the work site uh, in the Northwest Zone. More specifically, I'm thinking about uh, the Trap Peang Tma Dam work site as discussed in paragraphs uh, 323 up until 350. This was a work site uh, in the Northwest Zone, uh, a work site which was not developed in the very beginning of the DK period, but later. All kinds of very interesting issues uh, might have arisen there, which might further um, support uh, the view of the defense uh, in respect of the DK period. So my question is, uh, letting aside the very complex legal issues as to severance and as to the dropping of the charges, uh, how should we, uh, bearing in mind that this might be uh, de facto the only trial that we're still having, how are we to address these issues? So I think uh, the whole debate, apart from the legal issues, is much broader than only uh, question as to which crime sites and which um, particular crimes uh, are adjudicated. Um, these are just some pre uh, preliminary um, remarks. I think when it comes to the duration of the trial, uh, let me put up front that I believe that this trial is as equally complicated, uh, if not more, than the, the first trial. We will be dealing for the first time with the accusation of genocide. I find it difficult to believe that the prosecution wishes to prove its case of genocide by just hearing a few uh, crime-based uh, witnesses. Uh, if they be able to see, succeed in such a way, they will be the first uh, prosecutors in an international tribunal or a tribunal like this to do so. Uh, there are many uh, uh, very complex issues uh, relating to uh, the accusation of genocide. The same, of course, goes to S21. Uh, I need not remind the chamber that um, the position of New and Chia is completely different when it comes to uh, S21. Um, the position of Duik has been, as we all know, a completely different one than the position of our, uh, of our client. Um, his position as uh, uh, the accusations within the closing order is, in general, completely different than uh, the accused in the first trial. So just saying in a, in, in a, in a general manner of speaking, I think the prosecution um, is not only very optimistic in respect of um, the duration of the second trial in general, it's also very optimistic uh, when it comes to the actual legal and factual questions involved. Um, now, it's not necessary, and, and I think we agree on this, that we have to uh, debate all these issues at the very beginning. Um, it is very, very well possible to, to debate these uh, complex legal issues in the course of uh, the second trial. Uh, I, I may remind uh, the fact that the Supreme Court Chamber has, uh, has ruled that there are a certain minimum amount of charges that we have to deal with. Uh, it's perfectly feasible to start uh, with these accusations which the Supreme Court Chamber deems to be uh, uh, minimally adjudicated and in the course of um, uh, this trial we can, we can reevaluate the necessity of adding uh, uh, additional uh, crime sites. It might very well be possible that the development of the defense theory is, is perfectly possible within the framework of uh, the accusation of S21. And if we are able to, um, uh, to, to, to develop this position while questioning witnesses in relation to S21, we might not need uh, any more to have, for instance, the forced movement of population, the, the third phase uh, added uh, to uh, this trial. So um, having all said that, I think it's not necessarily uh, it's not necessary in the interest of justice and the and the and the rights of, of our client to immediately uh, 
discuss and decide all these issues. We can start, we can go along, and uh, while on the road, we can have further discussions on which uh, crime sites should or should not be added. Basically the same, uh, I, I, I would say, as the trial chamber has done in, in case 02-1, where there was a discussion um, uh, 14 months ago, which led ultimately to your decision uh, to have to portray added uh, as a crime site. Um, so uh, these are just some preliminary um, remarks that we have at this stage, um, and uh, I think we, we agree that there are some very complex legal issues to be decided, uh, but that should not necessarily stop uh, the commencement of a, a second trial uh, as soon as possible, as the Supreme Court Chamber has indicated. Thank you, uh, Council. Now the floor is given to the defense team for Mr. Kilsom Pon. You may proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Now, we do not hold the same position as the defense team for Mr. Nunchia with respect to the necessary expeditiousness uh, on the commencement of a second trial until all legal issues are resolved. I think we need to draw a lesson from case 002-1 to say that it would be preferable to take the time necessary in order to organize in an upstream manner uh, all of the contentious issues at hand to make sure that the trial will unfold in an efficient and effective manner. The first point is the following and I shall not be long. I won't be delving into the details of all of the legal issues that I deem significant, but I will recall the position of the defense team for Mr. Kiosompan by stating that case 002-2 must begin following a definitive appeal judgment issued by the Supreme Court. It is because we will have resolved a certain number of legal issues in 2 slash 1, which will have an impact on 002 slash 2, and that only then will we be able to act expeditiously on all of the matters raised by the parties. We will be able to decide on the modes of responsibility, and obviously that would have an impact on the number of witnesses to be summoned and how they shall be questioned. That is the first point. I also wish to recall that this position is not excessive, as uh, the co-prosecutor seemed to infer yesterday. I will remind your honors that there's very little time ahead of us. And the lead co-lawyers for the civil parties and the, uh, the co-prosecutors have acknowledged this. Based on my memory, the OCP's submissions from the 3rd of October 2011, E124-22, states this. It is also contained in decision E83, in which the trial chamber recalled in paragraph 64 the position of the civil party lead colors as well as OCP in saying that 02-2 could only begin once all decisions subject to appeal had been dispensed. This is why at the time, uh, who have, they had reasoned at the time uh, to come to that position and now have shifted their stances and uh, changed their reasoning based on the circumstances prevailing uh, today or perhaps based on uh, the disposition of the donor community. With respect to matters of law, yes, what is going to happen uh, to the factual allegations contained, all of the factual allegations 
and the counts contained in the indictment, as Judge Laverne has underscored. At the very least, we have to collect the opinions of all parties on what to do. I've also heard the co-prosecutors uh, present their preliminary uh, list of witnesses and uh, determination of the scope of 02-2. Obviously, the defense does not share this position. Obviously, we will be uh, submitting in written filings why such crime sites should also be explored. And as well as the eventual withdrawal of certain counts and whether or not the chamber will dismiss certain charges uh, before an actual decision is taken, consultation must take place. Representativeness, uh, be it decided by the co-prosecutors or the defense, has to be based on a very clear premise in a trial uh, several hypotheses are being challenged. And this leads me to my third point. To allow the defense to review the entirety of the remaining documents that would support the remaining charges contained in the paragraphs of the closing order that still have yet to be adjudicated upon by your honors, there's also the issue of the means to allow us to undertake this defense work. As I will state once again, preparation is crucial uh, to the hearings. And if we are not given the proper resources in terms of staff and tools to proceed appropriately, well, we will simply not be able to acquit ourselves of the tasks and fully defend our client, Mr. Kyu Sampon. Those are my preliminary observations that I sought to convey. Our position remains the same. We believe that a final appeal judgment will expedite the ensuing case of 002-2 in terms of duration and in terms of the availability and resources of the teams. Once you issue your decision in 02-1, there will be a time frame for the appeal to be lodged and to organize ourselves, and this has to be considered while anticipating future hearings. I shall not uh, go on more extensively but I believe that the legal points that have been raised by Judge Leverne as well as Mr. President and the other parties require that we contemplate in an in-depth and serious manner the way such issues should be resolved before we even contemplate considering a second trial. Thank you, uh, Counsel. I hand over the floor to Judge uh, Silver Cartwright. Your Honor, you may proceed. Thank you very much, President. Uh, first, um, uh, Madam Gise, uh, I'm intrigued by your submission that waiting until uh, a final verdict uh, is delivered by the Supreme Court will in fact expedite the process of beginning uh, a second trial in case two. Uh, perhaps a little bit of reality testing. Um, uh, I don't remember the exact exact timings now, but um, my recollection is that um, after this chamber delivered the verdict in the trial of Ganget Gek Yu, it took at least another year for the Supreme Court's verdict uh, to be delivered. Um, my recollection is approximately the same time as it took for this chamber to complete the trial and write the verdict, but I may be wrong about that. Had you taken that, the time that the Supreme Court needs into account in um, suggesting that it would actually expedite this process? Uh, and then I have a, a brief question also for uh, Mr. Corpy. 
Oui, madame le juge. Judge Cartwright, I am fully aware of the time frames necessary to issue a decision, but once again, unless an appeal judgment uh, is issued by the Supreme Court, it, it can occur, it must occur before 0 2 slash 2 begins. Obviously, based on uh, your rulings on modes of responsibility and other issues that uh, we may intervene on. That is to say, if the Supreme Court, and this is our wish, if the Supreme Court were to take a decision that would uh, go against your previous decisions, well, those would be definitive and those would be applicable to all. And it's the only way to allow uh, a proper beginning of 02-2, uh, barring violations of, of rights. Now, obviously, sometimes to act swiftly and expeditiously does not lead to the outcomes that we wish for. We need a definitive judgment in order to understand the basis on which we will proceed with this second trial. This is a matter of legal certainty, and obviously there will, other, there will be other issues that will be up for debate. Uh, this is uh, how I interpret the issue. Yes, uh, thank you. That, uh, of course, begs the question of uh, whether the Supreme Court um, will be able to conclude its appellate judgment on case 00201 um, within a time frame that enables the defense teams to remain intact and uh, other practical issues uh, to, be, um, to be dealt with. Uh, but I turn now, please, to Mr. Corpy. Uh, you proposed, Mr. Corpy, a, a, a procedure like the one undertaken in, in um, uh, case 00201, that the chamber leave open the precise scope of the trial and we add or maybe even subtract as we go along. Was this not a practice that was trenchantly criticized by the Supreme Court and are you advocating that we should not follow the guidance that the court has given us. I, underst I understand your question. Um, it obviously has our preference to know what the scope of the trial is before we go. Um, my point was that we do not necessarily uh, say that this uh, is something to be done before we start. Now, that's why I'm referring now to where I started with what is what, our, what, what the main point of our criticism was, was that the fact that we were not able to, um, to raise issues which we thought was relevant to our theory because of um, uh, the interpretation as to how the severance worked in practice. Um, if um, this would be different in, a ne in, a, in the next trial, if we would be able, uh, without uh, uh, continuous objection as to the scope of the trial, further develop this theory, then we wouldn't have so much problems in, in uh, the way it has been done in the first trial. So it's, these are two things which we feel are closely connected. Our frustration, is, uh, if you allow me this word, was the fact that we wanted to go a certain way, but we couldn't because we were uh, uh, told this was outside of the scope of the trial. Now, if that issue is solved, Solved. But if that is, uh, if our concerns are appreciated, then we would have uh, substantially less problems with the way it had been, it, it, it has been done um, in, in the first segment and could potentially be done in the second. The president, thank you. The International Deputy Prosecutor, you may proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, let me 
uh, briefly respond to some of the points that have been uh, brought up by the defense. Let me start first with the assertion by the Q. Sempan defense that uh, the prosecution has changed its position and that the second trial shouldn't start until a appeal judgment uh, from case 002 01. Um, first, in, in regards to the issue you raised, uh, Judge Cartwright, the uh, uh, trial chamber's judgment in case 001 was issued on uh, July 26, 2010. The appeal decision did not come until uh, the 3rd of February, 2012. So it took uh, about 18 months for an appeal decision. Um, the prosecution's position has not changed. What we have now, Your Honors, is an order. We have an order from the Supreme Court chamber that evidentiary proceedings in case 002-02 must commence as soon as possible. There's no reason for us to be debating anymore whether we are going to wait until after an appeal judgment or after your judgment. The Supreme Court has made its position on this known. They say, and when they say as soon as possible, they clarify in paragraph 72, they mean promptly following this trial management meeting. So I'm rather surprised to hear lawyers in this courtroom suggesting that we just ignore the order of the Supreme Court and wait until an appeal judgment in this case. That is not an option that is open here. Uh, in regards to uh, some of the concerns uh, Mr. Coppe has expressed, uh, I would suggest that uh, if they have an opportunity to review in detail the paragraphs of the closing order that we have proposed be included, the concerns he's expressed, I think he, he will not have them anymore. We're not, when you look at the proposal, this court will need to include the rather broad allegations about policy, about JCE, that are included in other sections beyond the crime base. That's all laid out in our filing. We specified the paragraphs, the additional paragraphs that we, that we believe would need to be included. And those include very detailed allegations about the purge of the East Zone to raise one of the examples. So I think if, if you review the paragraphs that would be included in this trial, they will certainly allow the defense to address that issue and I think all the others that they have brought up. And certainly the defense should have time to review our proposal. Uh, and I, I certainly agree that the defense should be allowed to pursue its theory. But I, I, I disagree very much that we are, uh, with, the, with the concept or with the suggestion that we are advocating a very narrow uh, set of allegations limited to some crime base. We make it very clear in our filing that the broad issues related to the policies of the regime uh, that are included in uh, the JCE section or policy section of the closing order need to be part of this trial. The uh, last point uh, I just wanted to make, and this is further to uh, the discussion that uh, we had this morning, uh, I, I kept notes um, at least through uh, May, uh, May of uh, this year in the trial, and I just want to note, and I'm not talking here about the civil parties who testified about victim impact. Uh, even in the, the list that I kept here, I see that there were uh, seven witnesses who were completed in three quarters of a day and another five witnesses who were completed in half a day. If you look at the crime-based witnesses, I kept a chart just to see how long we were taking with witnesses. You will see that the crime-based related witnesses were all very short. Most of them, the majority of them, were under a day. Uh, so I just wanted to, uh, I know you had concerns about that, um, and I do realize that you know, we're suggesting something that uh, is ambitious, but it is based, uh, it is not 
uh, there is a precedent for this. Uh, Crime-based witnesses, if you look at the actual time they took, were heard fa fairly quickly. Uh, unless you have any other questions that... Uh the President. Thank you. The lead co-lawyer for the Civil Party, if you have anything to say, you may proceed. Mr. Peyong. Good morning, Mr. President, and good morning, judges and everyone. I would like to respond to one uh, point uh, that was raised by uh, the Office of Co-Prosecutor in response to the point raised by uh, Madame Ong Ta uh, that we have uh, changed our position. As a matter of fact, uh, I support uh, the position of the Office of Co-Prosecutor. Our position is that uh, we won case uh, 002 uh, to move along expeditiously. And we also um, agree with the envision of the uh, trial chamber um, uh, judges. And we also um, expect that the uh, judgment in case 002-01 will be handed down uh, soon, uh, given the fact that the accused are now at their advancing age. And we have to emphasize that uh, it is important uh, when we uh, start uh, case 002 02, we have to ensure that this um, point have to be moved uh, forward expeditiously. We uh, share the same concern uh, in relation to the health status of the accused as well as the uh, status of health of the uh, civil parties and uh, the victims across uh, the country. So it is imperative that the uh, proceedings uh, on evidence in case 002 slash 02 uh, commence uh, sooner rather than uh, later. In response to the point raised by uh, Madame Antakisi, as well as the defense team for Mr. Kiel Sampon, if we take into consideration the time period uh, that K002 slash uh, 02 that may uh, commence according to them, uh, we have to wait until the um, appeal uh, judgment or the uh, judgment of case uh, 002 slash 01, uh, which will be sometimes in the second quarter of 2014. I believe that uh, it is very likely that there will be an appeal to the uh, Supreme Court chamber, and we will have to wait until for the decision of uh, by the Supreme Court chamber. That will take uh, uh, a greater period of time. It may take... Uh, more than one year and a half. So during this uh, period, I believe that we will have to uh, spend uh, time uh, waiting uh, while we while there is a possibility of commencing uh, the uh, second segment of trial. Uh, we have not. Uh, we have to. Uh, remember that the victims and the civil parties have been waiting for justice, so it has to be, um, we have to uh, understand uh, that uh, they have been impatiently waiting for the justice, so it is important that uh, K002 slash 02 uh, can commence um, as soon as possible. The President. Thank you, uh, the lead co-lawyer for the civil parties. The time is now appropriate for lunch adjournment. The meeting shall um, adjourn now and resume at 1.30 this afternoon. I invite all the parties and concerned individuals uh, to attend uh, this meeting this afternoon before 1.30. The meeting is now adjourned. Sure.